you're watching a mythology video and that probably means you're familiar with infinite sums. But did you ever encounter infinite fractions? Not many people have. Now infinite fractions are incredibly powerful tools for uncovering structure and patterns hidden in real numbers. And they're particularly good at picking out things that have to do with the rationality of numbers. So what I want to use them for today is chase down the most irrational of all real numbers. To get started, let's have a look at this identity here and save the right part in the box. So the box is equal to 1. So wherever I see a 1, I can replace it by the bit in the box. So for example here, replace, I see another one, replace. And you can see I can do this forever. And what that seems to say is that 1 is equal to 2 divided by 3 minus 2 divided by 3 minus 2 divided by 3 and so on. Now just to remind ourselves, what do we start with? This guy here. Now it turns out that if I replace all the 1's here by 2's, the identity actually stays an identity and I can repeat my game. So I replace, I replace again, I replace all the way to infinity and, well, let's have a look. The right sides here are actually identical, which means, of course, that 1 is equal to 2. Hmm. So I start exactly the same way as in the last video, but unlike last time, I'm not going to tell you what's wrong here. Obviously, something is wrong. You're supposed to work this out yourself in the comments. What I'll do instead is now talk about infinite fractions and by the end of this video, you should be able to figure out where the mistake is. Any number whatsoever has a representation as an infinite fraction, as a continued fraction. So let me just show you how you generate an infinite fraction using square root of 2. Okay, square root of 2 is equal to this guy here. So what I'll do is I'll separate out the integer part from the rest of the number. So there we go. And I'll rewrite this one here as, well, that's not quite it, but that's it. 1 over 1 over something is something, right? Okay, now I evaluate this one here and that gives me two point and now square root of two gives me something very remarkable here. The digits that are coming up here are now exactly the same digits as in square root of two. Not bad, huh? I play the same game again, separate integer part, rewrite this guy, evaluate and I keep on going like this forever and that gives me this continued fraction representation of square root of two. Now this guy is a very special kind of infinite fraction. It's a simple continued fraction. What makes it simple is the fact that all the numerators here are ones and you don't have any minuses here, so it's all pluses. So let's just try this for a couple of other superheroes among the real numbers. So for example, the golden ratio. Golden ratio plays a very important role in all this because it's got the sort of the simplest infinite continued fraction. It's got all ones down there. It doesn't get any simpler than this. When you have a close look, it's actually just 1 plus square root of 5 divided by 2, so more or less another square root, like square root of 2. Get something periodic here. In fact, any square root or slightly mucked up square root like this will give rise to a periodic continued fraction, infinite one. Maybe try this with square root of 3, square root of 5 and square root of 7. Now let's Take something that doesn't have anything to do with square roots. Let's go for E, another superhero, right? 2.718. If you have a look at the continued fraction of this guy, mm, no pattern. Well, there is a pattern. It starts around there. So let's just pick out those numbers. And looks are not deceiving, it actually continues like this. To compare these continued fractions to the decimal expansions of these numbers. Like decimal expansions are a complete mess. These continued fractions are beautiful, right? Beautiful, periodic, infinite too, whatever. Now, we can actually use these continued fractions and produce proofs that these numbers are irrational. How do we do this? Well, first of all, we have to have a look at the rational number. So what's a rational number? It's a number that can be written as a fraction. So take a fraction and unleash the scheme on this. What's the continued fraction that corresponds to this number? There it is. Now, maybe there's a bit of a surprise. This thing ends. It doesn't go on forever. And that's actually going to be the same for all fractions. So if you start with a fraction and produce the continued fraction that corresponds to it, that continued fraction will be finite. Really, really quite nice, isn't it? And you can check this out yourself. Maybe just do this one here and 
run the scheme, just don't turn this thing into a decimal number, just keep running with fraction forms and you'll actually see pretty much at a glance why this thing has to terminate and why all fractions have to terminate in terms of the continued fraction expansion. Once we know this, we have proofs basically that square root of 2, golden ratio and e and all these other square roots are actually irrational numbers. Why? Because, well, their continued fraction expansion continues forever, whereas if they were rational numbers, they would terminate. Neat, isn't it? Okay, now at this point in time, I'm now going to ask for the most irrational number. And that question may sound a little bit idiotic at first glance because either a number is rational or it's irrational. There's nothing in between, there's no gray zone here. So how can one number be more irrational than another number? To explain this gray zone, let's have another look at this identity. How do we actually check whether we've got an identity here or not? Well, what we do is we roll this thing up from the bottom, okay? So one plus one third is four thirds. Then one over that is this guy here, and then we calculate this, and we keep on going like this, and we find, yes, it's true. A friend of mine just took a number and produced a continuous fraction expansion infinite one, and he gives it to me and asks me, you figure out what number I started with. So there it is. And now, well, how do I figure out what number he started with? I can't roll this thing up from the bottom because there is no bottom. But now it turns out that these continued fractions have another really amazing property, which actually makes them very useful for all sorts of purposes. If you chop off things at the pluses, you create a sequence of partial fractions. So the first partial fraction is this guy, second partial fraction is this one here. All of these guys you can calculate. And the sequence of partial fractions always, always converges to the number that my friend started with here. Quick but very important interlude for us to write the equal sign here is really only justified because the sequence of partial fractions here converges to square root of 2 in this case. Remember, we were always pushing this term down there ahead of us and eventually I just kind of threw it away and replaced it by the three dots. Well, that's really only justify if we pin down exactly what we mean for things to still be equal at that point. The first partial fraction is just 3. The second partial fraction is 3 plus 1 7, which is 22 over 7. The third partial fraction is, well, just evaluate this guy here, rolling it up from the bottom that guy here. And you keep on going like this, or just one more to this guy here. So these are fractions that are getting closer and closer to whatever number we are after. And you probably guessed it already, 22 over 7 is a giveaway. Uh, what we are approximating here is pi. So this is the continued fraction expansion of pi, a simple one. To see how good these approximations are, let's just turn them into decimals. There we go. And here I've highlighted to what digit they actually correspond to the decimal expansion of pi. And you can see this one here, ridiculously good. Now these fractions that you see here on the left side, they're actually incredibly famous within the history of pi. In a very strict sense, they're the best approximations to pi. And just in general, it turns out that the partial fractions that come out of a continuous fraction expansion of a number are the best rational approximations to that number. Now in what sense? Obviously if you take larger and larger denominators you can get closer and closer with fractions to whatever number you're interested in. But the point here is that you're using very small denominators to really get incredibly close. So you wouldn't expect with just one digit to be able to get as close as that or with like a five digit number to get as close to that. So they're really punching way above their weight these, these fractions. And in the description I, I say a little bit more about the precise mathematical definition. So now we actually get this gray zone happening that I was talking about before. What we do is we take two numbers and we generate these partial fractions which are the best possible approximation, rational approximations, and then we compare. Well, which of these two numbers is easy to approximate and which is not so easy to approximate? Uh, using these, these partial fractions. Okay, well, let's just you know, compare those two guys, for example. Right? So there's phi, there's order all over here, and this one here, a bit of a mess, which 
one do you think is more irrational? Okay, I, I, I'd, I'd say most people would say uh, pi is more irrational, but actually would be wrong. This guy is the most irrational number. It's very hard to approximate this guy here with fractions, where it's, as we've just seen, it's very easy to approximate this one really, really well with fractions. And just to really drive home this point here, I've got a, a table of partial fractions next to each other, right? Here on the left side, you see the ones for pi, right? Really zooming into pi at an incredible speed. On the other hand, these best approximations for phi, they're really struggling to get close to phi. And you can replace pi by pretty much any other number here. Phi will always do a lot worse than anything else. And the reason for it doing a lot worse, when you have a really, really close look, is actually hidden in plain sight. It's got to do with these numbers here. So when you kind of scroll through these, these numbers like 3, 7, 15 and so on, the larger the numbers you have here, the closer you jump towards the real value when you evaluate the partial fraction. So like something like this, is an incredible jump towards the real value of pi when you evaluate this partial fraction. So when these numbers get small, the jumps get small and they get as small as possible if you just choose them as small as possible. If it's all ones, it doesn't get any smaller than this. And so this makes phi the most irrational of all irrational numbers. Who cares, right? <laughs> well, mathematicians definitely care. But you may also have heard that phi, the, the golden ratio, is present in nature all over the place. And in fact, whenever phi comes up, the Fibonacci numbers come up. And a lot of the phenomena that go with phi and the Fibonacci numbers coming up together in nature can actually be explained with these continued fractions. And just to give you a taste, I'm not going to do this today, but I'm going to do this in another video, just show you where the Fibonacci numbers are hiding in, in here. So if you actually produce the partial fractions, there you go, you can see Fibonacci numbers straight away. Right? There's the Fibonacci numbers, 1 plus 1 is 2, is 1 plus 2 is 3, and so on. And so what is an example of a natural occurrence of, of these things? Well, look at the flower head like this, this guy here, and count spirals that you see here twirling in one direction. That's a Fibonacci number twirling in the other direction, another Fibonacci number. And most people don't know this, but if you actually focus in on the middle part of a flower head like this, you actually see different Fibonacci numbers popping out. And in a flower head like this, this is actually grown with something called a divergence angle. And the divergence angle of a flower head like this and of many flower heads coming up in nature is actually phi. Again, I'll talk about this in a follow-up video. It's either the next video or the video after that. Okay, but at this point in time, you should actually be ready for, for the puzzle. So you figure out and you tell us in the, in the comments what's wrong here, what's right here and I'm really looking forward to this. And that's it for today.